Hello, I'm Robert Ellsberg, the publisher of Orvis Books, and I'm very happy to be here with a recent author, Robert Michael Franklin, who is the author of the new book, Moral Leadership, Integrity, Courage, Imagination. Uh, Dr. Franklin is the uh, as a professor of moral leadership at Can Candler School of Theology at Emory University in Atlanta. Uh, previously, he served as the 10th president of the illustrious Morehouse College, which has uh, been a training ground for generations of, of great African-American uh, leaders, including, of course, Martin Luther King Jr., uh, who plays an important role in, in this book. So welcome. Uh, to you. Thank you for joining us. And maybe you could tell us a little bit about what that title means, Moral Leadership, and why you decided to write a book about it. Thanks a lot, Robert. It's uh, good to join you. I have so much respect for your leadership at Orbis, uh, the work you uh, have done over the years with so many terrific authors, and it's a privilege for me to join uh, <laughs> that, uh, that uh, stable of talent, if you will. But also um, the importance of having conversations like this during what I perceive to be a critical zeitgeist, a critical moment in American history mm -hmm. and indirectly in, in our global um, community. Uh, moral leadership is an assertion uh, about a kind of leadership that promotes the common good uh, that includes others, even the nonconformists, mm -hmm. and aims at uh, inviting people to live better lives. And so in the subtitle, uh, you note that uh, it's, it's integrity, courage, imagination. And I suggest that uh, leadership that is moral leadership possesses an ensemble of virtues one could have selected any number of virtues as I talk mm. about this in the book, but I highlight three for our moment in time, because I think books, arguments, uh, uh, visions of a better life together are, uh, are context uh, bound and, and have a context that must be reckoned with. So for our time, leaders who are of integrity, where integrity points to the sense of alignment between the head, the, the heart, and one's behavior, one's hands. Uh, I talk about the importance of integrity as an act of centering down, utilizing the great Christian myth, mystic Howard Thurman as a way of helping us connect to the most deeply held values. The second virtue of courage, I think, is universally recognized as a noble and important uh, virtue certainly was the case in the uh, Greco-Roman heroic cultures, militaristic cultures, but especially in our time. And I see the four exemplars that I write about, Ella Baker, Dolores Huerta, the uh, uh, leader who helped to promote and nurture the United Farm Workers Organization with Cesar Chavez, my third mm -hmm. figure, and then Martin Luther King Jr., all of them exhibited this extraordinary courage. Courage comes from that Latin word pertaining to the heart, mm -hmm. and it is the work of the heart, stepping forth. Mm -hmm. I call it the act of stepping forth, in fact, mm -hmm. and uh, not being a bystander. And then finally, the, um, the, the virtue of imagination, the importance of, and I use the metaphor, dreaming up new solutions, to uh, old problems. And uh, that's a part of what Martin Luther King was doing in that 1963 address, I, I Have a Dream. But in our own contexts, imagination mobilizes the most creative instincts to puzzle out ways to, again, inspire people to be, uh, to release the better angels of their nature, mm -hmm. to foster community that is inclusive and respectful, and to uh, ultimately to invite others uh, to mm -hmm. join in. So those are the uh, virtues. And then I move on to talk about uh, what moral leaders, how they think and what they do. And I describe uh, five or six characteristics 
uh, including that they are lifelong students of the moral life, whether yeah. they ever take a course in ethics or justice. Uh, they are people who are intrigued by how we create communities that are just mm -hmm. and fair and loving and, and respectful. So that means they have to be lifelong learners, listening, mm -hmm. reading, studying, in dialogue with wiser people and other people about how to organize our communities in better ways. Mm -hmm. um, I also talk about the importance, you know, what leaders think, moral leaders think and do, the importance of public uh, proclamation, public witness through mm -hmm. writing, through speeches, and the role of the kind of public intellectual uh, dimension of all moral leadership. Mm -hmm. And then I move on to it, make an interesting move in the third chapter to look at the role of enduring institutions. Because mm -hmm. ultimately, when the individual moral leader is passing off the scene in one of the final moments of that second chapter, what moral leaders think and do, I argue that the final thing they do is prepare for a good death. And mm -hmm. they prepare their uh, followers. They have mm -hmm. a succession plan. They mm. focus on how people move forward beyond the span of my life. Mm -hmm. And institutions are ways of, of carrying that, that, uh, that work forward. And I <laughs> highlight Morehouse College. I highlight mm -hmm. the Chautauqua Institution in Western New York as a, a kind of global platform for moral discourse, for dialogue, for nurturing movements, so many progressive movements of America's uh, 19th century and early 20th century were nurtured at Chautauqua. And so, uh, at, but I end on an interesting, with a question. And the question is, can we repair? And I think that is the abiding question of our time and certainly will be as the America moves through a presidential election that could be exceedingly disruptive and a departure from the usual norms of peaceful transitions of power, respectful transitions of power. We're not sure what's going to happen. Uh, you know, we're, we're recording and having this conversation weeks ahead, but uh, it's going to be a fascinating time. And I've been urging all kinds of leaders, lawyers, physicians, engineers, doctors, grassroots community leaders, prepare your messages for how we repair a nation that is rent apart and suffering. I mean, it's almost, you know, March 1861, Abraham Lincoln speaking to a nation that is a house divided. And as uh, Doris Kearns Good would say, also a house that was on fire at that point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think, you know, one of the things that kind of interests me always is, um, you know, the difference between sort of heroes or a certain kind of idea we have of saints that we, we tend to venerate, uh, mm -hmm. but we don't think that they, you know, we could be like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and the difference between sort of a hero that, or a, a great sports star or something like that that we, that we admire, uh, and somebody who perhaps uh, through their example or through their leadership uh, empowers people or inspires people uh, to to rise to up to to, to to something higher and mm -hmm. we're certainly seeing you know you alluded to the election season you know here are the examples of leadership that seem to sometimes you know, bring out uh, you know the worst divisive kind of baser qualities mm -hmm. uh, and so I, I I think what you're writing about is 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 very timely mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and it's not just a matter of, you know, who are the people we admire, uh, but, you know, uh, what, do they, what do they evoke in us and how do they make us, and uh, make our, our society, our institutions better? Yes, yes. I, I, and I think, uh, it, were you finished making your point? Yes, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> so, no, I mean, I love what you're uh, observing in terms of, moving beyond the sense that the moral leader is the great woman or great man. I mean, there was a whole theory of leadership that was focused on, you know, the great person and his, usually his or her impact on history, uh, the direction of society. And Thomas Carlyle and others wrote about the great man. Even, uh, it's interesting, I often in classes use 
the current Prime Minister of the UK, uh, Boris Johnson, was, as many will know, once mayor of the city of London. Mm -hmm. During that time, he wrote about his hero, uh, Winston Churchill. And mm -hmm. he wrote in such glowing romantic terms that, you know, you know, Churchill's the only one that could have led Britain through World War II and out and beyond. And, and I just feel, you know, that that's really not entirely accurate and not particularly helpful to focus on leadership as celebrity. And part mm -hmm. of America's problem now is we have a celebrity, a reality star, uh, acting and, and, you know, as a, a leader of a nation mm -hmm. uh, without a real keen sense of what's required, what the vocation mm -hmm. of being president uh, happens to be. It's the same with uh, in the Senate and uh, in the House of Representatives and throughout uh, government and throughout the country. Uh, I, use, I begin this book, uh, as you know, writing about not a celebrity, but a, no. an ordinary woman who no one's ever heard of is my yeah. grandmother. That and I invite wonderful. people to think about their grandmothers and, and, and grand, grandfathers. Mm -hmm. And she was a woman who, in short, um, was willing to risk, ex exercise courage in placing her body in between two groups of young men who were about to have a fight. This is on the south side of Chicago in the late 60s, uh, mm -hmm. of street gang cultures. And when she heard this commotion right outside her house, we lived with her at the time, she ran out, aprons flying, and walked out and ran out and said, uh, young men, no one is going to fight today. No one is going to get hurt today. Mm -hmm. because No mother wants to receive the call that her child has been injured or killed. Uh, I received such a call years ago when my son was shot in, uh, mm -hmm. on the battlefield of Italy during World War II. Mm -hmm. And it was fascinating. I was eight or nine years old watching her, watching her ruin my reputation. This is my grandmother in the street with these, with these muscle-bound, you know, homeboys. And, uh, but I watched them look at her. And they looked at each other, and they looked at her, and they looked at each other, and they finally, mm -hmm. both of them, backed away mm -hmm. and walked away, certain to fight mm -hmm. in the, in a, on another day. Mm -hmm. But on that day, I saw moral leadership at work. Mm -hmm. And I looked up, and there were, in, on the porches of other households, people watching, mm -hmm. people who could have intervened and did not. Mm -hmm. but they were glad she was there. And, Mm -hmm. something in her called her mm -hmm. forth and i think that's the kind of inner wealth resourcefulness i am hoping my, my slender volume will invite and inspire and perhaps help educate people about how ordinary people with extraordinary dreams and courage mm -hmm. can redeem the soul of america mm -hmm. and i'll just say in in, in conclusion that last sentence, ordinary people with mm -hmm. extraordinary dreams can redeem the soul of America, is a line from John Lewis, Congressman mm -hmm. John Lewis's final message to the world, his epistle that was printed on the day we buried him here in Atlanta, July mm -hmm. 30, 2020, in the New York Times. So... Um, it's that sense that ordinary people have power. And he was really addressing the next generation, younger people, mm -hmm. and calling them forth to not simply, you know, fight for their own kind of uh, mm -hmm. political agendas, but to fight for and care for the soul of America, the entire nation, the common good, as mm -hmm. our preamble speaks of it. I'm glad you mentioned uh, John Lewis. Um, and of course, he, you know, recalls to us a time when, as you say, ordinary people uh, rose to, you know, a challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, their lives on the line. They faced uh, fire hoses. They faced beatings. They faced uh, dogs. Uh, we just you know, had anniversary just this uh, last week of the, the bombing of the church in in, in Birmingham. Uh, and John Lewis, of course, is uh, somebody we, we associate with that, that, that time. And as a matter of fact, 
uh, you are now uh, running in a uh, runoff, I guess, election to to uh, finish out his uh, his unfinished term, sort of just mm. carry the, the the baton across the uh, uh, finish line there uh, for him. Uh, could you say a little bit more about how John Lewis uh, kind of embodied those uh, qualities of moral leadership that you're talking about? Yes. It's interesting. During my uh, time of service as president of Morehouse College, I would go to Capitol Hill almost on a monthly basis, and I would speak with members, visit with members of the Georgia delegations from the House of Representatives and, <coughs> pardon me, the U.S. Uh, Senate, our two yeah. senators, who happen both to be Republicans. And I cultivated good relationships with all of them. But John Lewis, we always, we tried to make the visit with John Lewis the last one, because mm -hmm. I knew he'd want to talk. And he'd want to talk, and this is interesting, Robert, he'd want to talk about the relationship of love and power and justice, reconciliation, these large theological themes. Mm -hmm. So we'd start with policy and concerns we have about ensuring students uh, can afford higher education, ensuring that uh, cities, especially like Atlanta, have the kind of transportation needs they have. Uh, have and have the res resources to promote public transportation and support public education and criminal justice reform. I was there suggesting we needed more younger people, uh, talented people, and diversifying the workforce. So I wanted my Morehouse students to be a part of that uh, mm -hmm. new sort of STEM domain growing on and on. So we'd have those business conversations but then mm -hmm. at the end he wanted to shift and talk about you know dr franklin i've been thinking about about uh this love ethic of jesus and how challenging it is it's difficult in the world of politics and i thought okay here we, the seminar mm -hmm. has begun mm -hmm. and for the next hour he would he would sort of hold forth giving examples and disappoint things that disappointed him how the white house was or was not doing as much as it could to, 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 to bring the nation together, all sorts of wonderful discussions we'd have. And, uh, and, and so that really haunted me after John Lewis passed away on Friday, July 17. And I had a short window to decide how I would respond to that, how I would try to extend Congressman Lewis's legacy. And when I learned that other uh, leaders who I admired, what thought might be running, uh, were deciding not to, I thought, well, uh, it wouldn't hurt. And I felt this call deep inside to be faithful to those conversations that we had about love, power, and justice, and about moral leadership. Here, I just printed, you know, published a book this spring. And this was, in some sense, uh, kind of capturing the conversations with John Lewis. And now there was this moment, a kind of vacuum. So I offered, I've received co encouraging uh, messages. And uh, we'll see where this goes. We're just a couple of weeks uh, shy of the uh, special election. Mm -hmm. And uh, I want to honor John Lewis. I want to hold uh, this uh, President Trump accountable. Uh, I want to be able to bring hope and meaning uh, to a national crisis that, that is evolving. Mm -hmm. And of course, protect voting rights, mm -hmm. uh, fight COVID and ensure that economically fragile families have what they need to eat mm -hmm. and to be housed. And ultimately bring people together so we can deal with and eliminate structural racism mm -hmm. and police violence. So that's my kind of platform it's the spirit of John Lewis. I'm trying to carry forward humbly, and um, whether I win or not, I will continue this work. It may be as a professor and you know President Emeritus. Uh, it may be as a member of Congress. We'll see. We we, we will see, and and uh, whatever the outcome is, uh, it's a it uh, says something about the relevance of this book uh, to our current moment, yes. uh, just as we sit here. And so I really want to thank you very much for joining me today. And I think anybody who's listened to this uh, will, will understand that this is a, an extremely inspiring book. Uh, and it could be for 
I think uh, any uh, pastors, ministers, uh, anyone uh, in education, anyone who is in a position of of uh, forming uh, young people, especially, but also I could see this as a great gift for uh, graduating students or non-graduating uh, for their parents, uh, for anybody to reflect on uh, really what our, our capacity is as human beings and our obligations uh, living in a society and how to, by making ourselves better and rising to that, uh, that challenge, we can make our, our world a little bit better. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Franklin. It's really been a pleasure uh, talking thank to you. Thank you, Robert. Appreciate all the work you do, and uh, God bless to all. God bless you, and good luck to your, on your, your campaign.